Welcome. Um, today's lecture will be dedicated to Apple ecosystem. I'm currently in the University of Augsburg uh, on a conference on self-organizing and self-adaptive systems. It's pretty interesting. Um, that's why I'm recording this lecture instead of giving it uh, live in the class. Um, there is a number of very interesting topics about uh, field computing and about spatial computing related to mobile technologies. And of course, there is a lot about uh, self-organizing systems. I can share with you some of those uh, next time we have a lecture. But here we have to talk about Apple and iOS. So let's get cracking. All right, so first some fundamental aspects about um, the background. Uh, Apple is primarily a, a hardware manufacturer. Um, they control tightly um, software as well as the hardware on which that software runs. So they have a very aggressive approach to proprietary hardware and proprietary software modules. So it is very different to the approach Google takes to their uh, mobile ecosystem because Google is not a hardware manufacturer. In fact, they outsource entirely hardware manufacturing to hardware manufacturers such as LG, Samsung, um, or Sony, uh, and they focus entirely on software. Um, so we can see slightly different objectives. Um, OS X came about when Apple moved from proprietary Motorola uh, CPUs to Intel, um, and then redesigned the internals of the operating system to take advantage of the Unix, so they basically integrated a BSD core kernel into the um, into the operating system, and that feels very much like Unix. Uh, you have Bash, you have um, Unix-style um, file management uh, and access control, and the environment, um, and that's on the desktop size, uh, site and on the um, sort of laptops. And iOS was the uh, design for iPhone and it was designed to be kind of a single activity device. So as we discussed some of the differences between Android and iOS before, it was designed to be a single activity device. There was no multi-threading. Uh, it was a very reduce and remove paradigm which made iPhone, initial iPhone, very appealing, but also very limited. Um, so uh, some of the things that we were discussing before, um, such as no selection, no copy and paste, or no multi-threading. came a little bit um, better over time, and we have a fully featured environment and fully featured programming environment for iOS, uh, which, is, which is actually very nice. So how you do, how you do uh, iOS development? Well, um, you have two choices in terms of languages. You can either use Objective-C or you can use Swift. Um, they differ, we will show some examples in a minute. Uh, and Swift is becoming kind of a de facto open language for iOS and possibly for other platforms. We will see, we will see how, how it develops. Um, Xcode is the default IDE which you would use when you're programming in uh, on OS X either for the desktop or for mobile devices. It's very nice. Uh, it used to be pretty clunky actually uh, but the modern versions from 6 onwards, 6, 7 and 8 are fantastic. Uh, it has uh, built-in instruments for instrumentation and for debugging. Uh, you can analyze uh, your GPU, you can analyze your um, code execution. It, it, it's very nice to, to work with. Um, and then you can deploy on multiple physical devices. So you can deploy on iPod, iPhone, iPad, iWatch, uh, or Apple TV platforms. So you have uh, a number of um, platforms that you can target and have your system uh, deployed on. Started. Um, unfortunately, you will have to have a MacBook or Apple hardware, uh, even though 
theoretically you should be able to develop on Windows laptops. Um, it is much easier to set everything up on Apple hardware. Additionally, you will have to have an account as an Apple developer, um, which uh, grants you access to all the um, software and um, development packages. So you need to pay 99 US dollars per year for access to those resources. As a as an educational institution, we have a, an account, and you can ask me or Simon to get access uh, to have a a temporary profile assigned to you and then you can start developing. You can you can use tutorials, they have a very good uh, resources on the Apple developer page um, for getting you started and in general uh, apart from the language differences the, the programming is pretty straightforward so um, should you try it out as an Android developer to learn how to program on Apple uh, platform? I guess you, you could uh, it is a nice experience, you get, get to know different tools and different ways of achieving similar results. Um, in general, I found programming on Android slightly easier for more complex things, um, but yeah, your mileage may vary. So let's talk a little bit about the, the languages you have to use, which actually is quite an interesting topic. So um, historically, uh, we had kind of a statically typed um, flavors of C and we have extension forking in a sense where um, we went into kind of a very static uh, pathway for object orientation from C to C++ and at around the same time we went into more dynamic object orientation paradigm with Objective-C. So Objective-C has certain characteristics unlike C++ which allow uh, runtime type checking uh, or they allow us to call methods on objects that don't implement those methods and then have sort of a resolution of what to do if this type of call happens. In C++ all those things are caught by compiler and kind of you cannot have a runtime system which calls a method which, which doesn't exist for example. Um, then you have a different flavors uh, like C-sharp or D, which extend some of those concepts further. Um, Objective-C has some interesting characteristics, but it's quite an old language uh, and it feels a little bit dated uh, when you're using it. Uh, it has this sort of notion of message passing, delegates and protocols, um, and it also has a managed memory mode where you don't need to allocate and deallocate memory yourself. It is sort of similar to the modern C++ where you can let the runtime system manage memory for you. Um, so it has from Objective-C2 an automatic reference counting and garbage collect collection uh, on iOS as well. Um, so you will be using uh, Clank and LLVM when you're using both Objective-C or, or Swing. So how you call methods? Um, well, it's sort of different syntax to what you use on um, in C++. You basically use a square brackets and then you say an object on which you're calling a method followed by a colon, followed by uh, arguments to that method. Um, so you can, of course, nest messaging. So you can call message on the receiver and then message on the outcome of this, of this call here. Um, and you can allocate objects manually yourself using alloc and init which allocates the memory and then initializes the object or you can do both using new operator or new message um, and you have the same sort of syntax for references as with C++ so of course you have the main entry to, the, to your program uh, and it kind of follows the traditional C sort of conventions and you have delegates, so you're kind of implementing um, functions which, um, yeah, in this case, launch the UI for the application that you want to develop. So this is sort of the main um, entry point to application, and this is how you launch the the main UI for the program. 
2014, Apple released a new programming language, which made the feel of programming on iOS a little bit up to date, more more modern. Uh, it is it has very simple syntax. Um, it was it went through the second iteration in 2015, so a year ago, uh, and it retains some of the features of, of C and sort of Objective C, but with the refined syntax very familiar to C++ or Java developers. Uh, it hides memory management and pointers altogether. Uh, it tries to be a multi-paradigm language, so it has named parameters, closures, dynamic call dispatch and late binding for method calls. It's very extensible and it's protocol oriented. It feels very nice to, uh, to use uh, for people who like uh, dynamic programming languages. So let's have a look how it looks. Um, you have constants and variables. You declare them using var for variables and let for constants. It has a very syntax, a very easy syntax for classes. So here we have a class attribute called name, and here we are defining a function which takes a string as a parameter and returns string as a result, and we can sort of do operations with a return statement. So as you see, it, it looks pretty much like a modern ECMA 6 in the JavaScript world, or it's a very similar to, uh, to Java or even C++. Um, it has lack, you, you can notice the lack of semicolons at the end, uh, because the parser uh, tries to infer the information about end of um, lines and end of uh, commands, commands automatically. So it, it, looks, it looks quite clean. Um, um, it has built-in memory management, uh, and it is interesting that until version two of Objective C, that wasn't possible. So from iOS five onwards, we have automatic reference counting, and we have sort of a automatic memory management that was not possible before. Uh, but given that almost all software is now produced from five onwards, you can sort of consider memory management built in. Um, we will discuss memory management a little bit more later on. Uh, I talked already about it, talking about Symbian and um, the rationale for strict memory management on mobile systems. Uh, but the technology is progressing, the technology is changing, and for example, we can take some of those modern features now for granted. Um, as I was saying before, uh, Xcode currently feels very nice. I've used Xcode since version 3 and it was bad back in the day, but from version 4 onwards things substantially improved and the modern uh, Xcode IDE is, is very nice to use. Um, it is used for both um, desktop and mobile development. Uh, you have a nice interface builder with uh, storyboarding uh, and Git is built in. So of course, you're all using Git right now for the course, and it would be easy for you to use it from within Xcode because it's not a plugin, it's not an added on feature, it's built in natively into the ID itself. Um, the file structure and the file system is organized slightly differently than Android. Uh, you have to understand a little bit different layout of how the mobile application is structure, structured. Uh, but you have um, basically similar metaphor for splitting the code and logic from the way the UI is organized. And in, co in the context of iOS, you keep those in nip and zip files. Um, it, the programming model feels very UI driven. So everything, uh, almost everything in the uh, iOS development is driven by callbacks. So the initial startup of the application launches the UI and then from within the UI you basically react to user input. Uh, you can use timers as callback or you can use the network access as callback as well. Um, so everything feels uh, quite uniformly depending, depending on 
uh, heavy use of callbacks. Um, so events are generated is either by uh, network returning some values or timer ticking or user pressing some buttons and then those events need to be handled by uh, the callback functions that you attach to various components. Um, so everything is sort of focused on user interaction and, and responding to the, to the user input. Um, both on uh, desktop programming and on, and on iOS programming, uh, Apple systems heavily use the metaphor of model view controller, so typical MVC pattern, uh, and that is reflected in the uh, class hierarchy of the, um, of the a uh, API support that you have on, on Apple systems. So you have um, models which deal with the data structures that you store either in memory or in a persistent storage. Then you have the view which represents the UI representation of those models and then you have controllers which manipulate the models via means of some, of some uh, UI elements. So even though controllers could be separated uh, into individual classes, they typically are bundled up with a view so then the user can control the model via some interaction. Um, so in iOS you will notice that some of the view controllers are kind of combined into a single class, whereas a model usually stays as a separate concept modeled as a separate class in the object-oriented fashion. So, <clears throat> yes, I just described that. So you have a, a view which sort of is integrated with the controller and the controller updates the, the model and every time a model changes, it notifies the controller about the change so the controller can update the view. Um, so you will see design patterns kind of used throughout the, the development process. Um, how to set up yourself? As I was saying, you need to register as an Apple developer. Uh, you need to get a developer key uh, and then provision your profile on Xcode to, to use that key and then uh, hook up your device into the system so the system knows that the device that you are deploying for testing is yours uh, and you can um, write develop new applications and deploy them on your device using the provisioning profile. Uh, it used to be quite a difficult process, now it is quite streamlined. There is a wizard in Xcode which kind of guides you through and you can generate keys and contact the, uh, the portal automatically from within Xcode, but make sure that you have a good network connection to, do it stream, to, to have this process streamlined uh, while you're doing it. If you have any questions, please post them on Piazza. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about the Apple ecosystem later on as compared to Google in terms of app control and release of applications uh, on Google Play and I iTunes. Uh, but as for the technical support, from now on we'll be mostly focusing on Android and those of you who want to develop on iOS uh, use Piazza, ask questions, and ask me uh, during the lab sessions um, of how to achieve certain things. Thank you very much.